Now we, we throw the nervous system up like this, but in reality, each organ we look at, each system we look at, has sitting on side of it the nervous system, the immune system and the endocrine system. So when we look at the heart, there are endocrine and nervous system and immune system effects. When we look at the lungs, the same thing, kidneys, whatever. All right, so having to, to show you the nervous system, in fact, is like showing you all of the organs of the body. So it's a really, really interesting way of looking at it. I mean, it's divided up into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system is actually divided... Uh, sorry, central nervous system starts with the brain and the spinal cord there. And then the peripheral system are all the nerves that come off it. And we have here um, the cranial nerves, C1 to C8, the thoracic nerves, T1 to T12, lumbar nerves, L1 to L5, and the sacral nerves, S1 to S5. We have the brachial plexus, which are the nerves that run down the arm. And we have the sacral and lumbar plexuses, which are the, the bundles of nerves which go down the legs and then uh, the back, and etc. <coughs> Now the peripheral nervous system is divided into the sensory part and the motor part. Sensory is what we feel and a lot of that also involves pain. Um, and the motor division, there's an automatic nervous system component of that and a somatic nervous system component of that. And then we come over to the autonomic nervous system and we have the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division, which is probably where where we um, look at things is what we look at when we look at critical care stuff. Okay, um, of interest, the cranial nerves are in the peripheral nervous system even though they originate up in the, the upper part of the brain. Okay, do you want me to go through uh, neurons? Are you familiar with neurons? No? Okay, we'll keep going. First of all, neurons, there's um, a soma, axons and dendrites, and there's also connective tissue, which a lot of us don't realise is there. So, um, for example, in the brain, we have lots of neurons and nerves, which are bundles of neurons sort of running together. But it, they're all glued together with stuff called um, neuroglia, and there's microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Um, in that mix. Uh, so here we have our neuron. We have um, a soma, which is a cell body. The dendrites pick up information there. Uh, the information runs along the axon, and then we have the somatic terminals there. Um, and we have another, perhaps, an, an effector cell that picks up on the information. There are afferent or sensory neurons they are a little bit different to the motor neurons. And you can see here we have um, these little things here called nodes of Ranvia. And around that are Schwann cells wrapped around for the myelin. Uh, information in electrical current goes from hop, hoppity, hoppity, hop from each node rather than sort of a long drawn out process. So we have what's called saltery transmission of ele electrical current and it goes from one node to the other and hops along very nice and quickly. <coughs> now these are the supporting neuro um, neuroglia and with the oligodendrocytes are the ones that produce the myelin sheath and they wrap around the, um, the neuron uh, there. And you can see also the microglia, which are like the immune cells. They go around and gobble up all the bacteria that come through and are around the neuron. Astrocytes uh, suck all the goodness out of the capillary and they transfer them to the neuron. And we have epidemial cells which line 
um, all the ventricles in the brain and this around uh, as you go down the spinal cord um, and, and they've got little cilia on them and they actually have an immune function. <clears throat> now if I took a slice through someone's spine there, there would be uh, a little central canal and, oh sorry, spinal cord, there would be a central canal and then there would be white matter and grey matter. What's white matter consist of? What's the white stuff in the nervous system? Myelin. Okay, it's, it's that protection stuff. Myelin and the grey matter is actually the soma bodies, which is the nucleus of each of... So that's where all the... Um, that's where all the computer analysis stuff happens, if you'd like to put it. Whereas with the myelin, that's where all the transmission stuff happens. So we've got this piece here sliced. So we see, you can see that part there is the central canal and it's lined with epidemial cells. And then we have the grey matter. See this part here, if we transfer there, there's grey matter there. Okay, now in the grey matter you can see we've got the cell bodies, yeah. And then we've got a line here which you can't probably see. I'll just get the, my, my drawing thing out. We have a line here which is um, a grey and a white split. And between that, this is the grey matter up the top and the white matter there, down the bottom. And in the white matter, we've got the myelin sheaths. You can see those myelin sheaths. We've also got blood vessels. We've got an astrocyte, which is giving the goodness to the neuron. And we have a microglial cell running around, getting rid of the bacteria. <coughs> uh, and all these neuron bodies are actually doing the, um, the, the work of information processing, whereas the, down here we've got the, um, the axons which are doing the transmission. Okay, so grey is information processing and white is the transmission. Now, if we come to that point where the um, neuron actually attracts, is um, attached to uh, something it's providing information to. Say, for example, um, an effector organ. Okay, so we've, we've got that happening there. What we have is some interesting in, uh, bits and pieces that go on at that synaptic membrane and sub, um, synaptic cleft. And you can see these bundles of chemicals that are released and they go back and forth. Now, I'll have a look at that a little bit more closely. <coughs> this is the axon of the presynaptic neuron, and this is the um, dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. So we've got a dendrite here instead of an organ, but it's a similar setup. So the information comes along, and all these little vesicles of neurotransmitter, so things like acetylcholine, for example, yeah, they, they pick up on that information and then they release acetylcholine across and there's a mixture of sodium channeling that occurs and these little vesicles attach then to the receptor sites there. And as the sodium builds up, it becomes more and more positive and then we send off another electrical charge down this neuron here. But you need acetylcholine to be able to to um, get that transmission occurring. And a lot of the, um, um, <coughs> the neuromuscular blockers that we use in anaesthetics, for example, um, um, <coughs> succinthamonium and, um, come on, my brain's gone too, help me out here, rock, vent, yeah, um, they actually block things that happen here. Okay, so that's why, but in the motor, generally in the motor nerves. Okay, so 
we have sodium builds up, builds up, builds up, changes that resting potential and then we have suddenly an electrical current that goes across and triggers that synaptic activity and we have information processed across. Now, the neurotransmitters, there's acetylcholine, like I've said, that's a very general one, but you have on different aspects of different organs, we have norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin and histamine, and they're very similar, aren't they, to the things we give through an infusion? You know, so in fact what we're doing is we're actually facilitating neurotransmission when we give noradrenaline, for example. We also have things like glutamate, which is a very, very important excitatory amino acid that's in the nervous system. Uh, there's GABA, which is the inhibitory part. And in neuropeptides, which is a lot to do with pain management, we have substance P and opoids. <coughs> and most of the hormones that we talk about, for example, vasopressin and um, uh, you know, all sorts of other hormones that we talk about, um, they're actually facilitated through the nervous system um, action potentials as well. You can see here there's parasympathetic and sympathetic split in a somatic nervous system. Acetylcholine you will find in most of them, especially between, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, um, the sympathetic's a little bit different. But it, uh, you can see that norepinephrine becomes between the ganglion nicotinic receptors and the smooth muscle, perhaps cardiac nodes. We have norepinephrine there. Okay, so norepinephrine and epinephrine occur between the adrenal, um, adrenal medulla nicotinic receptors and the smooth muscle. So I'll go a couple of things ahead of myself here and show you that autonomic nervous system. And you can see here in red we have um, uh, parasympathetic and in blue are sympathetic. So you can see from T1 there's a sympathetic preganglion neuron and that comes to a point where acetylcholine is used to join that up. <coughs> what we have here, these little ganglions or, or gangl gran <coughs> ganglionics they're called or ganglia they're actual bundles of, of soma or um, neuron heads, the neuron bodies. So that's why they're, um, they're important. Uh, then you have another, another conduction here <coughs> with um, the autonomic nervous system. This is sympathetic in blue. Another neuron, and this time it goes to the lungs here at four. And number four, the synapse to the receptor site on the lung is actually norepinephrine, not acetylcholine. Acetylcholine happens here, norepinephrine happens here. But with the parasympathetic nervous system, it's all acetylcholine. You have acetylcholine here, and you have it here on the heart as well. So um, when we give norepinephrine or noradrenaline, which is the, the next um, uh, <coughs> derivative of it, <clears throat> we actually give it so that it affects the organ site in very specifically to the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, where were we? Okay, so just to give you an overview and put in perspective what it is we really are doing when we're giving someone noradrenaline or adrenaline or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> Now we've looked at the spinal cord and the grey matter and the white matter but, and we talked about the ganglions quickly, um, just those bundles of sensory ne neurons. You can see there's cell bodies of sensory neurons there and cell bodies of motor neurons. Uh, and they interact here. If you've got um, something that is a reflex, it will go th through only that part of the spinal cord and then come back. 
and do um, a reflex reaction. Okay, now these corticospinal tracts and dorsal columns, you'll find the cortical spinal tracts are descending neurons and the dorsal column are ascending neurons. So I don't know if that matters a great deal to you, but just to let you know. There's so much more to this than meets the eye. This is again the reflex. We hit someone's knee with the little hammer. <coughs> There's some receptors there <coughs> on the stimulus. And what happens is they, it goes through the femoral nerve down the motor neuron and makes that sensory nerve, uh, sorry, that stretch receptor work so that the whole foot goes that way. And you've had that done to yourself and suddenly this leg does this own thing. It doesn't make information processing up here, it does its own thing down there. It's fascinating the way that reflexes work. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Now generally speaking, if you've got someone with a nervous system issue, and most people have one, whether or not they're admitted with whatever diagnosis, pH affects the neural function, so someone who has an acidosis, and probably an acidosis below about 7.1, will be semi-conscious. You cannot be awake with, um, with a low pH. Uh, and hyperkalemia has, makes um, nervous tissue very excited. It does all sorts of things. And if you're cold or if you're over hot, you'll find that um, the nerves, nervous system doesn't work so well. Um, now the ionic composition of extracellular fluids, mainly sodium is the one we've got to watch. You'll find that um, just subtle changes in sodium will affect someone's state of consciousness big time, uh, if, especially if they become <coughs> hy hyponatremic and probably a sodium below about 125. You'll find them go a little bit nana. Yeah. Well, we could do a lovely delirium test, all, but you know what I mean. <coughs> now, I think you know this fight fight or flight for sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system is relax and digest. Yeah. Okay, I've talked to that one. Uh, and we have here, this is, this is interesting. First of all, we've got T. It's T for thoracic, okay? And we have the autonomic nervous system here, which is sympathetic in blue. You can see how it goes to a chain of sympathetic ganglia. Then we have different, different um, organs. There are some more ganglion in between. Adrenal gland, kidney, pancreas, um, large intestine, etc., etc. You can see those. You can have a look at those. Also, we have some to the salivary glands. Pardon me, to the eye. <coughs> But the parasympathetic mainly comes from the midbrain and the pons and the medulla up there at the top or right down here at the bottom is um, uh, S2, S3, S4 sacral nerves. Um, anyone who has bladder surgery or gynecological surgery you will find will have an overstimulated parasympathetic nervous system and that's why they come out of theatre and recovery really, really hypotensive quite often. Uh, and if someone has a spinal injury at the cervical spine, sometimes they have a predominance of the parasympathetic nervous system there because this here has been sort of cut off. The sympathetic response has been diminished. So it can be very difficult because spinal patients often are very bradycardic and hypotensive but they don't respond very well to any adrenaline and things like that because you can see that we can't use that sympathetic nervous system there. All right. There's another picture <coughs> I've just put in, you know, I like pictures. 
Okay, the brain. <coughs> Most amazing organ. And we really don't know a lot about it. And the more you learn about it, the more you realise how much you don't know. 2% of your body weight, 18% of our resting energy consumption. So that is why we look for the barley sugar all the time when we study. You know, do you do that? No? <laughs> okay, so um, we need... Um, so there's a lot of stuff that happens metabolically. Um, you can see all those... So we've talked a bit about a sodium-potassium exchange pump there. There's movement of materials from the cell body back and forth and there's neurotransmitter molecules back and forth. Now, <coughs> what you really need to know, first of all, is the brain does not contain glycogen. So it relies on glucose. And that is why when you get to a certain blood sugar level, someone becomes unconscious. Do you, do you know, if I, if I talk about, about the NICE sugar study, do you know what I'm talking about? No. It's, anyone? No. We went through this phase where we actually kept blood sugars in intensive care patients really, really tight, you know, about six, perhaps even five, four to six with our insulin. And what we found was that we actually had from this NICE, it's called NICE, which is um, N-I-C-E, but it stands for something. It's an acronym for something. What, what we found was that because the blood sugar was so low and, and nice and even, that the brain actually wasn't getting any sugar, any glucose. And that group of patients actually died. So the mortality rate was actually higher for patients with tight blood glucose levels than those that had moderate ones. Ones with really high ones, of course, had a high mortality as well. And this, you guys are pretty into the keeping the sugars, you know, moderate. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why. Um, it's because the brain actually needs glucose. And... They've done the studies by actually doing some... Um, one, one of the ways that you can monitor the brain is doing microdialysis where you put a little tube into the, to the brain tissue and, and drain some of the fluid and you measure it for lactate and glucose and all those sort of products. And they found that the, blood glu the glucose levels in the brain with the blood sugar when you're sick in critical illness is actually you know, about two points lower than what you would have um, if you had um, a normal blood sugar. So in stress response, which is what we see in our patients when they, they come along, they actually need that little bit of high blood sugar for the brain to, 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 to manage. Of course, when it starts to get up too high, then we have enormous inflammatory response with hyperglycemia, which... Um, <coughs> inflammatory response is another thing I can talk to you about later. All right, now, circulation. We also need to have plenty of blood flow. So we need glucose and we need blood flow. And we, in the blood flow, we need to have glucose and we need to have oxygen. All right? Makes sense? <coughs> All right. <coughs> Here's the big words, so I need the drink. All right, so there's, there's all these things to the brain. Let's have a look. First of all, we have a skull, and we have within it here, we have the cortex of the brain, uh, we have the midbrain, and we have then the brain stem. We have this cauliflower projection, which is the cere cere cerebellum. And you can see it's all protected very nicely with bone and whatever. Of interest to us, mainly, is the, is the midbrain and the brainstem, because that tends to be what uh, 
causes and affects a lot of the autonomic functions of the body. The hypothalamus there and we also have um, can't find it. Uh, the hippocampus and we also within the midbrain and the brain stem we have the um, activating reticulating center which is the part that determines how awake we are. Okay. Now if we cut the brain you can see your brains up here if we cut it sliced it down there you can see that we have all these folds and it's done like that so we can actually get a lot more in the skull. So and then there's a little fissure down here and we have what's called the corpus callosum which is fibrous tissue that goes across here. It's connective tissue and what it does it actually connects the right brain to the left brain left brain to the right brain and it's particularly thick in musicians for some reason because they need to use both their right brain and their left brain whereas if you're a mathematician you would have a thinner one because it just uses the left brain so that's interesting so if you want your child to develop really good left right brain mix you go and send them along to music lessons it doesn't mean they're going to be a musician <laughs> It's all about brain development. Anyway, we have here ventricles and sliced down. Now you can see there's the white matter again and the grey matter. What does white matter do? Transmission, Transmission of, of information and the grey matter is your little computer information centre. Yeah. So, okay. You can see that there's little spots that have both. Yeah. All right. Now the brain changes with age. We've got an elderly brain here in B, um, middle-aged brain here. Unfortunately, both aren't alive. <laughs> so these are from, um, at, you know. Anyway, you can see basically that these folds here are a lot wider in someone who's old. And the, um, what's the word? It's just thinner and less elastic, you know, so a bit like your skin as you get old, you know, how it loses that lovely collagen. It sort of happens to the brain as well. But there's a lot of other processes that happen with ageing and of course one of them is um, the deterioration of blood flow to the brain uh, and also the deterioration of the processes that occur within the brain. When they say middle-aged, That's fairly <laughs> subjective, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. When I, when I said middle-aged, I thought 50. Yeah. But that's probably because I'm somewhere near there too, hey? Yeah. All right. <coughs> Functional areas. Now, this is important in your assessment stuff. You know, if someone has a stroke or an injury, um, we have different areas. First of all, there's only a small area here which is for sensory function and small bit for motor function here okay the information comes up and goes through the brain stem and comes up and then goes back down I'm oh, sorry goes up oh, I'll get rid of that goes up to the sensory and comes down f with the motor okay that makes sense we also have speech so if we have um, a middle cere cerebral artery clot it blocks it up, it will affect the blood flow to the speech area, maybe smell, maybe hearing, certainly emotions. That's why, yeah. Uh, but generally they still have their posture and stuff if they have intact motor function, but generally they don't. You can see why the face is one of the first things to go in a stroke because it's in the middle there. Yep. Oops. 
All right, so brainstem, very, very interesting part. Sits up here in the brain. Lovely little cap there. We have the thalamus, midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and it joins onto the spinal cord. And we have here, these originate the um, cranial nerves. Okay, uh, cranial nerve one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Vagus nerve is the biggest cranial nerve, a hypoglossal nerve, and the spinal accessory nerve. Okay. And oh, this hasn't come up that clearly, but these um, you can see the, um, the different things that each of the cranial nerves do. The, um, the olfactory nerve, one is for smell, two is your eyes, three are also eyes. So when you do your pupillary assessment, you're actually doing optic nerve two, three, and probably a little bit of four. Yeah, you know all that. Okay, so I'll just, um, I find the um, vagus nerve a very fascinating nerve, and I'll talk to you a bit more about that. Um, so again, that's how it all sits. Um, there's some notes there of what different areas do. Probably the hypothalamus is the one that we see, do, deal a lot with, with critical illness. Uh, it affects a lot of the autonomic functions and the hormones that get, uh, a lot of the time we have to supplement critical illness with different hormones such as um, vasopressin and corticosteroids and things like that. Yep. All right. Ventricles, important to know if you're doing some ICP monitoring, if you're going to stick in a, um, a ventricular catheter, it will go into the top part of the ventricle there. Okay. Um, and it, interesting the way it's shaped, there's the, the lateral ventricles, um, the third ventricle, there's a little aqueduct there, and the fourth ventricle's right down mm -hmm. the base here. Uh, and you'll find that these are filled full of fluid and if the pressure builds up too much, of course, it can, um, uh, it, it takes the road in rather than the road out to expand. Okay, so now the skull is lined with um, this lovely dura lining. And you can see these are the, the uh, veins and the sinuses of the blood that returns back to the body. Um, the sinuses, the venous sinuses drain without, you know, they have to drain naturally so that if you've got someone's head in a really awkward position, they don't drain well and you build up, actually build up um, circulation in the, in the brain. Uh, the meninges are very, very tough coating, and the cerebral spinal fluid uh, actually takes a lot of the weight of the brain. Um, let's see, the human brain weighs about 1,400 grams in air, but only 50 grams when supported by cerebral spinal fluid. So that's interesting, isn't it, that it sort of cushions that weight so that our, he our heads are already very heavy, but it actually takes that weight and distributes it. Um, yeah. Cerebral spinal fluid is produced up here in the choroid plexus of the third ventricle, and then it, it rotates around and has a, a distribution that moves around. Remember, we've got the epidemial little cells that have these cilia working, and they push it around, we have a flow thing happening. Okay, so it comes down, you can see some little arrows there, back and forth, it goes down the, uh, the spinal cord and back, um, and that's when we can do um, a uh, sample CSF from the spinal cord when we do a spinal tap. Okay. Arterial circulation is very important and especially we're going to look at stroke a little bit today. So you can see here that we have, um, first of all, the carotids supply this on either side. Uh, and then we have up here 
the um, b um, Bazilla artery, um, and it comes up to what's called the circle of Willis there. Okay, probably the one that we see most of is the middle cerebral artery there, which tends to get blocked off with clots and thrombi. All right, uh, and you can see that sideways there of the brain. Uh, it would affect a stroke on that side of the brain. And what happens there is that, of course, we've got all those um, functions of um, hearing, uh, sensations of the face, muscular effects of the face, emotions, um, and then we have the motor supply that crosses down to the legs and hands, so we get the hemiparesis happening. I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Now the blood brain barrier, very, very important because it actually keeps the brain quite sterile. It's tight as you cannot get stuff through this blood brain barrier. Uh, so we have on the blood on one side of it there. You can see this is a, this is um uh, sliced through um blood vessel. And you can see the astrocytes here. Remember they suck all the stuff out of the blood vessels and they send it off to the neuron here. Yeah, remember that? Yep. Yeah. Um, endothelial cell which lines the blood vessels. Um, the neuron has a basement membrane there. So very tight. Um, this is what it looks like. The endothelial cells which line it are very tight. Now if you have something like atherosclerosis for example, when you have a build-up here of atheroma, uh, you'll find that the blood supply to the brain is a lot less, and you'll also find that the, this will obstruct and have issues similar to a myocardial infarction, and that's how stroke develops. The other side, we have the astrocytes and the microglia, which we've talked about. All right, so I've talked to you about white and grey matter in the brain. Okay, so there's the white. Remember, they're the ones that transmit the information and the grey is the information processing areas. Look at these nerves, how they bundles of nerves. These are neurons all put together that join and they're actually within a sheath within a sheath so that it, you get these sort of bundles of nerves that go right from the end of the body right up What's interesting is they actually cross across here, which is fascinating. So any damage to this part of the brain here, for example, will affect this side of the motor system. So that when uh, someone has um, right-sided hemiparesis, it's actually the left side of the brain that's affected, which is interesting. You see how beautiful they are, aren't they beautiful? I just find them fascinating. <laughs> anyway. Yes, quite often um, it will be the left side of the face as well. Now it depends which, what area you're looking at. For example, we've got it crossing across here uh, in the brain stem, all right? But it also crosses across, and I've put this in here to show you. It crosses across, um, for example, I'm cooking and I hit something hot, and the information transfer, it actually crosses across here in the spinal cord rather than up the top. So the sensory stuff often crosses across below whereas the motor stuff seems to cross up here. Yeah. Um, so your sensory deprivation will be different to your motor deprivation in a stroke. So that's why you've sort of got to test things differently. So yeah, that's all I wanted to show you with that one. Um, pain pathways um, are fairly straightforward. They go up to the sensory cortex. All right. And they've got special groups of nerves which are quite different to motor and sensory nerves. Yep. <coughs> How are you going? You all right? You all yawning? Might have a break in a couple of minutes. I just want to show you this one. 
and the one after it <coughs> before we do. First of all, what this shows is that triad of um, the brain, the nervous system, the immune system and the endocrine system. They're all in, 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 you know, it's one system. It's one overarching system. So we need to understand how they interact. It's only been in the last five years that we've really understood how the nervous system affects immune cells. Yeah. Now, if I look at it over here, we've got an immune system. These are the immune system organs. There's the thymus up here in the throat. Thoracic duct, which has got some, um, it's where the lymph joins the blood vessels. Lymph nodes, pie patches of lymph nodes in, in, the, in the intestines. The spleen, of course, and bone marrow. Peripheral blood leukocytes, yep. Over here we have endocrine system, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, uh, and the reproductive organs. And up here we have the um, thyroid, the thy um, thyroid tropin, um, ACTH, endomorphins, um, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin and growth hormone. They're all involved in it together around the pituitary gr uh, gland there. But, and we have autonomic nervous system which affects them both. Now, I'll just move on a bit because it's a bit overwhelming to try and explain all that detail to you. But this is fairly new, this stuff. And where it fits in is that when someone is critically ill or they have a critical illness event, it doesn't mean that they're in ICU. It might be because they're very sick and they have a stress response. What we find is that the, um, a lot of this, there's the person becomes what they call, um, they have an inflammatory response, an immune inflammatory response to being sick. Now, what is of interest is that the sympathetic nervous system actually increases inflammation in someone, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system decreases it. And that's only just new sort of stuff. So when we look at a patient, their inflammatory response is actually, it's okay if it's to heal, but if it becomes overwhelming, they actually end up dying. Have you seen someone who's critically ill who's very inflamed, they've got a high fever, you know, they're, um, they're just swollen and they're hot and their the heart rate's going 100 miles an hour. Um, that inflammatory response is actually overwhelming for that person and they develop multi-organ failure. Now, you can see that the parasympathetic nervous system actually has receptor sites on the immune cells. And this here is actually the vagus nerve. And one of my interests, my research interests in fact, is about parasympathetic nervous system and how it affects the immune system. And what this means is that if we don't have enough parasympathetic nervous system activation in everyday life and we have a sympathetic nervous system stimulation instead or stress, we end up having a, um, an inflammatory base to our homeostasis which is actually quite high. Have I lost you? No? Okay. So people who are very stressed will have a high inflammatory response in their body. And if they do, <coughs> if they do, it means that they're prone then to atherosclerosis, <coughs> to diabetes, and to metabolic syndrome because they're, they're the product of inflammation, chronic inflammation. And so if you have someone turn up who's critically ill, who already has chronic disease with diabetes, etc., their inflammatory markers are already up. And you will find that 
they will have a response to being sick it tends not to be a natural healing response with inflammation it tends to be an overwhelming critical illness response so what we see is that their immune system goes out of control they get an inflammatory response which is overwhelming they get multi-organ failure from that but also their autonomic nervous system is quite deranged so anyone with critical illness has it's about in, um, overwhelming inflammation it's about autonomic nerve dysfunction it's about immune system which has gone haywire and of course the endocrine system follows that through and often we have to supplement that and of course this is what my my thesis is about you see with my PhD so and that's a hundred words long so I won't a hundred thousand words long so I won't start okay <laughs> all right do you want a break